My name's Amata, and in this Red Gamer Tech video, I am here with a very heavily Intel leaning video. In fact, we only have one non Intel item for you today, which of course is a collection of the last tech news from the last 24 or so hours, as per usual. So, what do I have for you today? Well, the first item on our itinerary is the fact that Intel have stopped development and deployment of Spectre microcode updates for several CPU families, and then we have an i9 6 core CPU coming to laptop. And speaking on the mobile front, we have an unveiling of Coffee Leg U processors Iris Plus graphics. And then finally, our non-Intel item and our non-tech item is actually regarding Middle Earth Shadow of War. But this is definitely something that definitely deserves attention. So let's start things out with Spectre and Microcode. So we have the latest update to the Microcode Revision Guidance Guide, yes, Guidance Guide, from Intel, and they have apparently stopped development of mitigations for some of their processors' families that haven't yet been updated to fight against Spectre. Now, obviously, the path to getting these updates has been a very slow and painful and kind of back and forth one with updates being pulled and then put out again and then fixes, having to put on fixes, on fixes, like I discussed yesterday. And now these ones are probably not going to get updates at all. And these families of products such as Penryn, Wolfdale, Bloomfield and Yorkfield, among a few others, are apparently just being given the cold shoulder. Now, you will see on screen the state on production status for mitigations for these families have been updated to show stopped. And you might go, OK, but why have they done this? And Intel have actually said, quote, after a comprehensive investigation of the microarchitectures and microcode capabilities for these products, Intel has determined to not release microcode updates for these products for one or more reasons, including, but not limited to, the following. Microarchitectural characteristics that preclude a practical implementation of feature, fe features, excuse me, mitigating variant two. B. Limited commercially available system software support. And C. Based on custom inputs, most of these products are implemented as closed systems and therefore are expected to have a likely lower hood of exposure to these vulnerabilities. Now, obviously, if we see a sudden explosion of these processes being attacked now that people know that, hey, these are going to be unprotected always. Intel might change their tune as the lawyers might start coming out the woodwork again, but for the moment at least, they are not bothering with these particular families. So, obviously, again, putting it in sort of TLDR terms, it's regarding to practical implementation of features, the limited software support, and the fact that they believe that a lot of these products are being implemented as closed systems, and obviously the fact that these families are a little bit older is definitely going to be a factor as well but a bit disappointing to say the least hopefully we don't see anyone becoming a victim of spectre due to this but of course we'll have to wait and see anyway let's move on to our next item which of course is regarding the i9 coming to laptops so basically we have six core cpus coming to laptops including the i9 8950hk and according to what Intel have said, the CPU is 29% faster than the 7th gen i7 when it comes to general performance. And when we're talking specific performance, you're looking at a 41% increase while playing Warhammer 2 and a 59% increase while editing 4K video in Adobe Premiere Pro. Now, of course, I'd say most average users aren't editing 4K video in Premiere, but it's still a really nice CPU, especially for a laptop. And obviously, if you're a content creator like myself or someone like that, then this might be something that tickles your fancy. Now, it also has a single core turbo boost speed of 4.8 gigahertz, and it's fully unlocked. Now, we do have a bunch more 8th generation chips targeted at laptops released, sorry, announced as well. These include the 8750H, 8850H, and they come with 9 megabytes of cache, plus two Xeon CPUs, and obviously one of them is the i9-8950K, which I've already just mentioned. So let's just go over a few specs, shall we? As we have the i5-8400H offering four cores and eight threads, and apart from one or two exceptions, all of the previous i5s have been two cores, but even now the slowest of the lot we have an offer today, the 8259U, will have four cores and eight threads. So even the lowest end of this particular reveal is more powerful than the previous generation. 
And just an extra cool little feature as well, all of these and their accompanying chipsets will support Intel's Optane technology, which is basically large cache memory modules that speed up the performance of your PC. And once again, according to Intel's own internal figures, this does mean that it will increase game loading speed Four times, sorry, up to 4.7 times faster than the 8750, sorry, on the 8750H, excuse me, it's like slip of the tongue there, but you got my meaning in the end. Overall, all of these are looking very, very impressive, and of course the fact that i9 is coming to laptops is pretty nice as well. Unsurprisingly, oh sorry, I would expect rather that these will be rather expensive, but obviously people who are looking to edit 4K video are probably going to be a bit more expecting of that, I suppose you could say. But even looking at the sort of more, hey, this is more for your average user processes that we've had revealed today, they are all looking rather nice and looking like good improvements over their predecessors. So let's move on to our third and final Intel item, because we have Middle Earth Shadow of War after that, as we have Coffee Lake U. So Intel were just itching to reveal stuff today apparently, as they have also unveiled their Coffee Lake U parts which feature Iris Plus graphics, and these are mainstream mobility processors that have the Intel GPU solution inside. So just to confuse things, this new Coffee Lake lineup, which is four chips, has basically nothing to do with the existing Coffee Lake U parts, so yay! And these new parts will be priced at a slight premium due to the improved specs as you might expect, plus, you know, they like money as well, so, you know. And I know something they're going, yeah, 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 get to the point, what about the specs? Well, we have a few features from Intel. Some of them are laptop specific, so I'm not really gonna go too much into them, but the important parts are the RS Plus graphics, which I've already mentioned, the four cores and the eight threads, or up to, should I say. We also have more on package DRAM, and obviously laptop stuff like Optane memory and so on. But the thing that stands out the most is the increased eDRAM size of 128 megabytes. Now, previous ones have come with 64 megs, and so this basically means it's literally double the size. And this also has 48 execution units clocked at above 1.1 gigahertz. So we're going to be seeing quite the jump in graphics performance. Now, I do have some specs for you for the flagship, which is the 8559U, which has four cores and eight threads, and the base clock of 2.7 gigahertz and boost clock of 4.5, as well as eight megabytes of L3 cache, and supports dual channel memory supporting DDR4 2400. And we also have a TDP of 28 watts, so what about the other ones I hear you ask? Well, we have the 8269U, which has 2.69 base clock speed, boost of 4.2, again, four cores, eight threads, same amount of cache, they all do, apart from the very lowest, which I'll get to last, of course. But then we have the 8259U, which is 2.3 base clock speed and 3.8 boost, and once again, four cores, eight threads, with six megabytes of cache. And then finally, the i3-8109U, which has three gigahertz base clock and up to 3.6 boost, with two cores and four threads and four megabytes of cache. So, you know, fairly decent, not going to blow anyone's socks off and not nearly as exciting as the i9 chips and obviously the other 8th gen ones that we had, but it's not really surprising. So let's finish up things with Middle-Earth Shadow of War. Now, of course, this game was probably one of the poster childs of the sort of rapidly increasing problem of microtransactions in AAA games, and obviously also one of the poster childs of ones where it's done rather badly at the expense of the game, as per many people's opinions and now we have some massive updates coming to the game and the flagship one out of them is the removal of the paid for currency which is of course gold as well as war chests which is basically the fancy in-game name for loot boxes so we're also going to be seeing sorry we will see the remainder of Mirian, the in-game currency, unsurprisingly, but you will not be able to buy war chests with it. So instead you can buy gem slots or upgrade your fortresses. Now, there are going to be more uses for the currency added, such as being able to buy training orders, upgrade gear, and reroll stats and that sort of thing. But the main thing, as I said, is the removal of the in-game currency and the war chests. 
And we have a post here from Monolith saying, quote, simply being aware that they are available for purchase reduces the immersion in the world and takes away from the challenge of building your personal army and your fortress. Now, the in-game currency is going to remain in the game until May the 8th and the market will permanently close on July the 17th. Any gold you have can be used up until then, but after that time it will be converted into in-game items. Now this is good, don't get me wrong, this is very very good, I'm glad they're making this move, but I am a bit sort of sceptical I guess as to why it's being done now. By the time it gets removed it would have been roughly six months ever since the game released, so why is it taking them six months to pull a feature that arguably shouldn't have been there if, to use Monolith's own words, was ruining the immersion of the game and obviously was, you know, doing the whole thing of, you know, rinsing even more money from someone who'd already paid $60 and arguably, you know, affecting the game negatively and all this other stuff that everyone under the sun has covered to death at this point. I don't really need to harp on too much about it. You all know whether or not you care about it and you want to know whether and all the details about it all that sort of thing obviously if you decide to play it anyway and ignore it or decided to buy the war chest or whatever that's obviously completely and utterly your choice personally i skipped this one not for any reasons to do the microtransactions or that it didn't help but just because it didn't really look that great in comparison to its predecessor it looked like yes the expansion of the nemesis system was great but other than that it didn't really look too brilliant and again the microtransactions didn't really help so you know there was that but Again, I am glad to see the air being removed, but again, I'm just sceptical as to why it's been done basically six months after the fact. You could argue, oh, okay, they, they basically made the money that they want to make from it, and now they're removing it to get some big, good boy brownie points. And now I'm like, okay, yeah, but why was it there for so long in the first place? Or why was it there ever if it ruins the immersion? Like, come on, really? Apparently, it, the immersion didn't matter for six months. It doesn't take six months to do this, is what I'm saying. So, yeah. Kind of me cynical, but, uh, yeah. It's just as good, but, uh, why was it there in the first place, is my question. <laughs> anyway, that's me done for this video. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.